So I grew up Christian and I have since reverted to Islam or converted to Islam, depending on how you look at it. But I've never told my full story. And that's for a couple of reasons. But the main two reasons would be, one, it's such a long story. But then two, I've only really been able to look in hindsight as to all the things that have led up to this point with clarity that I could only have gained from Islam. And it'll make sense as I tell the story. But this is my attempt to tell my full story as to how I became a Muslim from Christianity. So to tell the story, I always have to go way back. And when I say way back, I mean five, six, seven years old. Because growing up, I've always been God conscious, alhamdulillah, which means I'll praise to God, I'll praise to Allah. And when I say I've always been God conscious, I've always been aware that there's a power much greater than me. Even before I knew who God was or what God was or where God was, I've always known that there was someone or something responsible for the vastness of this planet. I just had to know because I understood that I came from my parents, but then I thought, where did my parents come from? Where did my parents' parents come from? And so on and so forth. There had to have been an origin. And although I couldn't articulate that as a kid, I've always known it in like the deepest part of my heart or my soul. So naturally, as I grew older, I started learning about what was called religion. And because my entire family we're all Christian. Maybe some of us are Christian by name, but we're all Christian just to keep it simple. So naturally, the questions that I would ask about religion were all surrounding Jesus because Jesus is the foundational and most prominent figure in the religion. That's why it's called Jesus Christ, you know, Christianity. So of course, my questions were about Jesus. And this, I think, is like the the seeds being planted of my eventual reversion or conversion to Islam because my confusion about Christianity came not because it was what I was hearing or the things I would be told were confusing, but because I would be told such different things. That was what confused me. For example, I would ask one person, who's Jesus? And maybe the first answer I would get was Jesus is God. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. That's why we always say Jesus. And when we pray, we say in, in Jesus' name. It makes sense. But then I would ask someone else, and someone else would tell me, oh, yeah, Jesus is God's son. And I'm like, but that's not what the first person said. Okay, that's weird. Then I would ask someone else, and they would say, oh, you know, it's both. Like, there's something called a trinity. It's the spirit. It's the son. It's the the father. It's it's complicated, Cornell, but just just know that they're both right. And I think at that point, I just kind of pushed religion to the side because I thought maybe I'm just not old enough to understand. Maybe I'm just not smart enough to understand. Maybe I'll approach religion when I'm older. Mind you, I'll still go to church with my family, but I kind of like that personal relationship that I have, that I had as a kid. Because as a kid, I would enter rooms and I would always think about God before I make any decision. Like I would be very tapped into the guidance that I would receive. I don't know how I was receiving it or where or why, but I would always feel as though I'm getting guided. And I had always thought as a kid, like this is just my little secret. Like it always felt like it wasn't just me. It was me with someone else or something else. So when I walk in a room, I felt as though I had an advantage in every aspect of my life. I would look at a kid and be like, uh, see, I'm going to do the right thing because you don't, you probably don't have what I have. So anyways, so as I got confused, I pushed myself away from religion or I just kept like a distance because I just thought it was, it just, it confused me. If Christianity and Jesus is such a prominent foundational figure of that religion, why do so, why do so many people have different opinions of who Jesus was? And I guess who God was in that sense, too. It just seemed weird to me. Like, why is there not a unanimous consensus? So that confusion, I think, is the first seed that led me to, to Islam eventually. So 
grown up. Yeah, it's so funny. That's my call to prayer. I'll try to make this video quick so I can pray. But after that period, that period actually lasted years. So I would say from age 10 to maybe age 21, I spent my entire life not knowing about religion at all. Whether that's Christianity, whether that's Islam, whether it's Judaism, Hinduism. I just kind of just kept a distance from religion as a whole. But my best friend growing up, we knew every single thing about each other. But the one thing we didn't know about each other is we didn't know each other's religion. Only Allah knows, only God knows why that's the case. But we knew everything about each other. He knew what made me upset. He knew when I was pretending to be happy. He knew when I was uh, sad. He knew what I liked. He knew what I disliked. My favorite food, my favorite drink, my favorite everything. He knew everything. So, and vice versa. Like, we just, we knew each other. We definitely knew each other inside and out. But the one thing we didn't know is each other's religion. So I remember I overheard him talking about Islam um, in university. And he didn't know I was listening because I had my headphones in. And I usually put my headphones in. Even though I'm not listening to music, I'm, I have it in so people just leave me alone so I can focus. So I'm doing my stuff, doing my stuff, studying, studying, studying. And I overhear him talking about Islam to another friend. And the thing about my friend or my best friend is that he was a class clown. He would say the most outrageous things, like outrageous, things that I could not repeat right now. And obviously because he's he's very devout and very pious, so he'll never admit to it now. But as he's talking about Islam, I'm almost waiting for the punchline, like the joke. Because I've noticed the way he's talking, I've never heard him talk like this in my life. And again, we knew everything about each other. So I know that he doesn't talk like this. He doesn't sound serious. It wasn't even serious. It was just, he just sounded different. So I'm listening, I'm listening, I'm listening, and the punchline never came. The joke never came. So I'm like, okay, that's that's interesting. I didn't ask him about it, but I kind of kept it in the back of my head. Like, what was this guy talking about? So maybe a week passed, and Allah, his timing and his plan is perfect. Because for me to be in another situation and have that exact same situation happen a week later, like, subhanAllah, all glory belongs to God. All glory belongs to Allah. So I'm in another room, headphones in, studying, and I hear him talking about Islam again to the same person. And I'm listening, I'm listening, I'm listening. And again, I'm waiting for the punchline. I'm waiting for the joke. Didn't come. The second they finished their conversation, I actually asked my friend, like, what were you talking about? Like, what was that? He's like, oh, no, I'm just talking about uh, Islam. I'm Muslim. As soon as he says that, he looks at me and I look at him and we're just like, wait, he's like, wait what religion are you? And it dawned on us in that moment that that is the one thing we didn't know about each other is that we did not know each other's religion, which is wild to me still to this day. It's wild how that happens, but Allah knows. So he's listening. I'm listening. Or he asked me, so what religion are you? And I said, oh, my typical response was, oh, like my family's Christian, but I consider myself more spiritual. Like I have a, I believe in God but I have my own relationship. I don't really follow a religion. It was my go-to answer. And I thought I was so, I thought it was like so clever for me to say that. Uh, and he kind of pushed back and he's like, wait, but why, why are you not like more devout about Christianity? Like if your parents grew up Christian and your whole family grew up Christian, why are you not more pious? Like, why don't you stand behind it? Like, why are you not more devout? Um, and then I explained to him, but I couldn't really explain it. I can only explain it now again in hindsight. But at the time, I was like, that is a good question. I have, I have no idea. I don't know. I just find it. And then eventually it got to me saying the words. I just find it confusing. And then subhanAllah, what he said, all glory belongs to God for him saying this. And he doesn't even remember him saying this. But that just goes to show when Allah is ready to guide someone, he uses people as tools. Because the words he said stuck to me so hard. And he said, you know what, Cornell? You should probably think of religion like a train. I think I know why you're confused. And I'm like, what do you mean it's like a train? The train represents life. And the people on the train represent the people of the world. So think of the train continuing. And the train never stops because that's life. Life keeps going until the day of judgment. Until the last day. 
what God would do is he would choose someone on that train to deliver a message to the rest of the people on that train. And I'm like, okay, I'm following. That person that he would choose is called a messenger, a prophet. I'm like, okay, interesting. And he said there were thousands of prophets across time. But some of the main ones you probably know in Christianity too. And then he started naming some. There's Abraham, and then there's Moses, and then there's Noah, and then there's 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 even Jesus. I'm like, Jesus? Like, Jesus is a messenger? And he's like, hold on, hold on. What happened is that, of course, the train is continuing, but prophets are what? They're humans. And what happens to humans? They eventually pass away. So when God chooses a messenger to deliver a message on that train to everyone else, everyone on the on the train, they get that direct message from God to practice monotheism, like the oneness of God. But he said, eventually they pass away. So what do you think happens to that authentic message from God? I said, I don't know, maybe people forget it. It's like, yes, people forget it, but then some people change it. Some people go against it. Some people add things. Some people remove things. It's human nature. If something works for you that isn't what the law is or what the rules are, you'll apply it and you'll think that everyone else will benefit benefit from it too. So he said the major religion, it started with Judaism. It wasn't called Judaism, but um, the religion that came from, from Moses or Musa, peace be upon him. And then once that was delivered, of course, Musa passes away because he's human. And then the next major prophet was actually Jesus. And Jesus came to rejuvenate the message because it had changed so much. And I'm like, okay, that makes sense. What do you think happened when Isa, we don't believe he passed, but when he was sent back up, I'm like, oh, the message again changed again. He's like 100%. So why do you think you were so confused when you would ask different people in your family or different friends or different pastors? Why do you think there's so many different opinions about Christianity? Why do you think there's so many denominations of Christianity? Why do you think it's split to Orthodox and Catholicism and Jehovah's Witness and this and this and this? Because everyone eventually followed a different path of that religion because it had changed by humans. But then I thought, okay, but why is that such a bad thing though? Because if you want to follow a message directly from God, you don't want it to be influenced by humans. You want it to be a direct source. And I'm like, oh yeah, true. So I'm like, what happened? There's another prophet after Jesus. It was Muhammad, peace be upon him, and peace be upon them all. I'm like, okay, but then, oh, so that's Islam? And he's like, yeah, that's Islam. But I'm like, okay, but then how did that one not get changed and corrupted as well? He said, because of something called the Quran. And this... I think is, not even I think, this is 100% the biggest seed that was planted in my heart for me to eventually revert to Islam. Because before I even opened the Quran, before I even knew about the words of the Quran, it was just me understanding the Quran in and of itself and how the Quran prevented this issue of messages being human influenced. Because what he said is that all the other prophets, <clears throat> including Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, but every major prophet, they perform miracles. And the reason why they perform miracles is because they needed to be able to show the other people in that train. And again, that train is life. It's continuing. They needed to be able to show the people on the train that they are not ordinary people. They're still humans. They are still people. But they are god's chosen person so they perform miracles to show everyone else what i'm telling you right now is actually from god is actually a divine message so they perform miracles to show them moses you know part in the sea his staff turning into a snake noah building an ark and being able to have one of each animal you know uh jesus being able to speak as a baby abraham being thrown in fire and surviving like these were all to show that they were actually divinely inspired. So what he told me is that the Quran is that miracle. And I'm like, okay, but how is it that miracle? He said, because the Quran is perfectly preserved. It's never been changed, which is why you can see a three-year-old in Algeria and a seven-year-old in, in Japan and a 40-year-old in Australia and a 30-year-old in Canada 
and a 50 year old in the United States, they can all recite the exact same message, the exact same Quran in Arabic. It may have been translated in different languages, but it all stems from the exact same source. And Allah allowed it to be preserved because how he actually, how the message was sent to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, wasn't as a physical book. It came into his heart and he was allowed to memorize it. Like this is all memorization. And the way it was preserved is because as he was learning the Quran, he taught all of his companions. So there was always at least a dozen people that had the exact same text, the exact same words, the exact same message memorized. So when it came to be an actual physical, tangible book, there was a whole community of people that were able to verify the message. If one person forgot, there's another 50, 20 that can be like, nope, this is what it was. If someone made a mistake and said, no, this is what it is, there's another 20 that can verify it. If anyone's in finance, this is exactly what cryptocurrency is, what blockchain technology is. It verifies as a community, as a group. And when you compare that, this is a little bit of a tangent, but when you compare that to uh, the Torah being translated and passed over time, or the Bible being passed over time, it was never done through memorization. It was done book to book. There was literally a person, a transcriber, who had to literally write it. As someone is saying it, they have to write it. And as you write things, it's there's way more possibilities for you to make a mistake as you're writing it. You could get tired. You could miss an entire line. You may add things because you just want to, but no one else can tell you any any different. There was no one over your shoulder verifying what you're writing versus the Quran. And even if you don't believe that that's how it came to be, you can believe it based on the result right now. Every single person has the exact same Arabic Quran memorized. And that's why when we're praying, we can actually, there's people that will correct the, the leader of the prayer, which is the Iman. They can correct them instantly if they make a mistake. And I've seen it with my own eyes. They're reciting the Quran because that's what prayers are. There's one person reading the Quran and everyone else is listening. And if the person leading the Quran makes even the slightest mistake, there's four people in the front row that coughs or says, no, that's not it. It's this instead. And that's all over the world. I've heard the Quran spoken in at least four countries now. And it's the same. And it's beautiful. So once he explained that about the Quran, I was like, oh, my goodness. I didn't say this out loud, but in my heart, I'm like, this is exactly what I was searching for. I just wanted to learn more about God because I've had that personal relationship or connection with God ever since I was a kid. But I've never been able to increase that connection because I didn't really know what to do. I didn't really know who God was. I knew God was there. The entity of God is there. But I didn't know what to do to increase that relationship, what to avoid to increase that relationship, what to say I didn't know who God was, the attributes, the, the names. I didn't know any of that. I didn't know how to learn more about him. But then when he told me that the Quran is a direct, authenticated message from God, from Allah, that was my way to learn more about him. So that that's kind of the, the second seed. The, sir, the third seed, and this is more of a, what happened to me. So I kind of kept that in the back of my head. I didn't revert right away. But I kind of knew, I think in hindsight, what I was thinking in my head and in my heart was if I were to ever need religion, it would be Islam. It would be Islam because it just made so much sense. But I was still at the point where I felt as though what I had was enough. Like my personal relationship was enough because it has brought me so far. <laughs> but this is where this is where it gets different. So when I say that it has brought me so far, my personal relationship, that way of me operating life or approaching life has always been the same. If I'm ever going to make a decision, I consult with God or I, I kind of ask God, I get an answer, I just follow the, the guidance and then I make a decision. That has brought me so much success in life up until university. But things started taking a turn ever since I had graduated university because I was at a point where it took me so long to find a job. I was seeing everyone around me finding jobs, but I couldn't. 
and I started to feel behind. I started to feel as though, yeah, I really need to go pray. I, I didn't time this right, but um, yeah, it really got to the point where I started to feel like I was behind in life because I was wondering, I did everything right. I got into such a, got into such a beautiful program in school, in university. Why can I not find a job when people are in quote unquote worse programs and they're finding full-time jobs? So it just took me, it took me eight months to find something that I didn't even want. And it wasn't even full-time. This is all to give you context, by the way, this is not me complaining. This is like the, a blessing for me in disguise. But long story short, I couldn't find what I wanted. And I started to feel as though maybe I need to stop relying on God. Because maybe God is getting it wrong now. Maybe I need to start relying more on myself. Like maybe I need to start making more decisions without feeling as though I need to ask God for guidance. Ask Allah for guidance. So, of course, we all know what happens when you start to ignore God. Like things start to get harder naturally because you're not making the right decisions you're taking the you're becoming self-reliant when you're not supposed to be self-reliant you're supposed to have your reliance strictly on Allah so it got to the point where on my last day of my job I woke up so sick and I woke up sick because and the reason I tell you that I woke up sick is because I should have just went back to bed. I remember I woke up and I'm dying. Like I have a, the flu, like I'm congested and my body's weak. I'm sore and I'm limping to work. I'm limping out of my bed and I'm get ready. My mom sees one look at me and she says, what are you doing? Go back to sleep. It's not worth it. And I'm just like, no, mom, I have to. I have to. Like I have to go to work. It's my last day. If I don't go to work, they may not give me a... They may not extend my contract and I need this job because if I don't have this job, which I don't even like and I don't even, I feel like I'm too smart for, then I literally have nothing. I have to go. I have to go. My mom's like, it doesn't matter. Like your health comes first. I'm like, I can't. I have to go. I have to go. So I get out of my bed. I change and I leave the house. This is Allah's most beautiful timing and beautiful plan. Because I literally got into a car accident right at the intersection of my job. Right at the intersection. Because I'm driving, I'm driving, and I'm, I guess I'm not as sharp. I don't know. But I'm driving, and I'm driving, and I'm driving. And right at the intersection, I get into an accident. It wasn't my fault, but that doesn't even matter. Because because of that car accident, I, and I guess I should explain. I should explain this, actually. When you get into a car accident... If anyone has ever been in a car accident, they know that right before you make impact, it's like everything just slows down. It gets to a point where you just kind of know that you're about to hit. But things are going fast. But It's going slow, but you're not thinking about everything. I'm not thinking, do I even have my seatbelt on? I'm not thinking, am I going fast enough for me to like die? You're just, all you're thinking is I'm about to hit. And I remember the last thing that I thought about was, oh God, oh God. Please make me safe. Keep me alive. Keep me alive. Like, that's all I'm saying. And like, it's going slow motion. And then I hit. But I remember that me very specifically asking, begging Allah, keep me, begging God, begging Allah, keep me safe. Keep me safe. Keep me alive. Once you hit, adrenaline kind of just, hit, it just, it takes over. And then you start, you, you start feeling yourself. You're like, okay, I, I'm alive. I feel my legs. I feel everything. And then you look out, so you get out of the car, you see the other person, you see their life, and then everything kind of just like goes back to normal speed. And then to spare you the details, once I s realize that I'm alive and I'm safe and the other person's alive and I'm safe, the dunya, this world, all these worldly issues and concerns, they start flooding in. Because now I'm thinking about, oh, I can't go to work because I have to now go and get go to the insurance place i'm not thinking about my car that's totaled which means it's destroyed beyond repair and how insurance works is they don't really give you what your car is worth because if you bought a car and it, I, don't, I don't need to give you the details so i lost my car i now lost my job because i couldn't go in to negotiate my contract being renewed 
So I lost my car. I lost my job. I'm still sick. Now I have a headache. And I'm just feeling like, like, why me? That's what I'm feeling. Why me? This is the point in my life where it's the lowest of the low. I remember feeling so depressed because I'm thinking I do so well. I am a good person. I'm, I work hard. I, I'm respectful to people. And before this, I'm, I consider God in every decision I make. Mind you, in this period, I, I stopped. I stopped. I started ignoring God. But I'm just thinking, I forgot about that. But I'm thinking, why me? So my best friend, the same friend that told me about Islam, he noticed that I stopped. I was very disconnected and I wasn't answering calls and I wasn't calling back. And he just noticed that I wasn't good. So eventually I answered the phone and long story short, he's trying to make me feel better. And he's like, everything happens for a reason. In my head, I'm thinking, you're just giving me a speech. Like, I don't want to hear it. Like, what do you mean everything happens for a reason? I got into a car accident. What beautiful reason could there be in that? I didn't say it out loud, but he probably sensed that's what I was thinking. But the last thing that he said before we 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 hung up or we stopped the call, he's like, yo, Cornell, just, you know, it could be a blessing in disguise. You could have died, man. The second he said that, a wave of guilt hit me. Because it reminded me of what exactly I had prayed for in that moment before I actually got into that car accident. What I was praying for came true because what I prayed for is, oh God, keep me safe, keep me alive. And that happened. But the second that blessing was received, what did my mind go to? Oh, I lost my car. Oh, I lost my job. Oh, I have less money now. Oh, now I have to look for a new car. Oh, now I have now I need to find a new job. Oh, I feel behind in life. All the monetary dunya surface level things became priority over the one thing that matters the most, which is God kept me safe. God kept me alive. I could have easily have not had my seatbelt on. I could have easily have been driving so fast that my car could have swerved and exploded. There's so many things that could have happened. So many things. He, the other car could have hit me on the driver's side. Like, I literally could have died. But God kept me safe. And instantly I forgot about that. So a, a wave of guilt hit me because I admitted to myself in that moment that I need to make a change. That connection that I have with Allah, that connection that I have with God, I didn't know who Allah was at the time. But that connection that I have with God, I need to bring it back but I need to increase it. Like I actually need a tool to increase my connection with God. And that's when I started looking more into Islam again. And at this point it was quick because all I needed to do was re fall in love with the idea of what the Quran is and what it represents. Then I started looking into the miracles in the Quran, like the numerical miracles, the scientific miracles, the theological miracles, the prophetic miracles. Like if you do a simple YouTube search, you'll see that there are so many miraculous things about the Quran, miraculous things, even before you read it, the things that are named the same amount of times like heaven and hell and angels and devil and, and night and day. And then there's there, they, there's scientific miracles that literally science is catching up to what the Quran says about fetuses about the mountains about the two different seas like salt water salt water and fresh water and how it, you can see the difference and there's just so many things and there it's beautiful once i started watching those and learning about those it made me it almost cemented the idea that this quran this body of text is not man made it's not human made it is from allah it is divine there is no human that can ever be able to replicate it because there's too many things about it that are just so divine and so miraculous. So that means I fell in love with the book, which means I had to have fallen in love with Islam because Islam, through Islam, the book came. So then when I started learning about Islam and the things that you have to do and, and, and how it literally corrects all the problems that humans face, I'll, like there's, there's, there's too many. 
there's too many. But long story short, I started learning about the Quran again. And then I took my Shahada and I reverted to Islam. But right before I took my Shahada, because I still was at the point where I was so in love with Islam, I just wanted to learn more and do more. But I almost made the mistake of, you know what? Let me learn as much as I can and then let me revert. Then let me convert to Islam. But then my friend told me something so beautiful. The last, one of the last things that the devil, shaitan, wants of you is he does not want you to get closer to, Islam, to Allah. He does not want you to revert to Islam. Why? Because he knows that Islam is going to be that key, that gatekeep, that, that tool to actually get you closer to Allah, to get you closer to loving your creator, our creator. So what he's going to do is he's going to try to delay you taking your shahada for as long as possible. And he's not going to just flip a switch and make you not want to. You're still going to love Islam. You're still going to believe it's the truth. But he's going to extend time and slowly and slowly try to add more doubt into your heart and into your mind. No, you're not ready. Oh, what are your parents going to think? Oh, it's too complicated. Oh, it's too strict. Oh, it's too complex. Oh, it's true demanding. Oh, your life is going to change. Like over time, he's going to start whispering these thoughts of doubt. And then eventually you'll forget that love and that certainty that you have for Islam. Once he told me that, I said, let's go. Let's go tomorrow. My friend said, no, let's go today. I'm like, let's go today. And then I took my shahada. And then as a Muslim, I started learning about Islam on the inside versus on the outside, if that makes sense. Because I still, I still didn't know so much. But that's fine. That's okay. Because there's a reason why Islam took 23 years to be. 23 years. Because Allah already knows it's a slow and beautiful journey. And the thing that separates someone that's a believer and a non-believer is someone that's continuously making little tiny baby steps in the right direction. That's it. You're not expected to become a sheikh or become a scholar overnight. Majority of people will never become scholars or even close to scholars. But what's going to make someone a pious person is someone that is taking steps because Allah already knows what pace you need for this religion. Allah knows everything you need to learn, when you need to learn it, how quickly you need to learn it, and how you're going to learn it. So why not be in the inside as you get that guidance? And thank God that I did because I was able to fall in love with this religion so much easier from being in the inside versus on the outside because it's beautiful. I got to feel all the benefits of it. So that's my full story. That's my full story. But the three things that I'm gonna emphasize, one, sometimes you need to be confused with something else to see the clarity of something, right? If you have two things in your hand and one is not, one is very complicated and very ambiguous and very contradictory, that's only going to make the other side appear that much more clear and simple. That you'll appreciate that clarity and that simplicity so much more. And that was me with Christianity versus Islam. When you look at Christianity, it's I still see so many conflicting ideologies from within the religion. It's not even Muslims and Christians debating. It's Christians and Christians debating. Christians and Catholics debating. Like there's no consensus. But how could there be? How could there be? An analogy that I always use is that if you have a glass of water and it's 95% water and 5% poison, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that 95, it's still 95% water, but you're still not gonna drink it, are you? Because that 5% poison is enough for it to become undrinkable. And that's what, that's how I perceive the Bible. The Bible could have 95% truth, but there's 5% poison. And we don't know where that poison is. We don't know what was changed. We don't know how it was changed. We don't know if a major thing was changed. We don't know if a lot of minor things were changed. We just know that we can't rely on that as the source of truth because we don't know what the truth actually is. It's undrinkable. 
if we think about it as water versus the Quran, it's 100% water. So whatever you read, even if, even if you don't understand it right away, you know it's the truth. You know that even if you don't agree with it in your heart, it's from Allah, it's from our creator. So there's wisdom in it that we just don't understand. So when I read something and I don't get it, I just try to find the answer. And I always do. Because there's always going to be divine wisdom in it. Versus with Christianity, if you don't find something, if something confuses you, there's no direct answer. You'll have half people saying, oh, uh, ignore that. Or another half saying, uh, uh, just this is what the answer is, I think. Like there's no clear consensus to a lot of things that are confusing. So that's the first thing. Second thing, learn about the Quran. The Quran was the miracle that got Islam to spread across the world. Learn about the miracles of the Quran and then read the Quran. Because part of the miracles of the Quran is actually the words that you read and how it heals you. It's a book of healing. And you'll stumble upon, you'll stumble upon a passage in the Quran that may not speak to anyone else in that moment, but it'll speak to you directly. And you won't understand why it speaks to you. But it's going to heal that part of your heart that you need to be healed in ways that you would never have anticipated. That's part of the miracle too. But even before you even open it, just learn about it, how it came to be, and how miraculous it is, all the miracles about it. And if you're a science person, learn about the scientific miracles. If you're an a academic type of person, like you love words and you love reading and literature, read about how it's structured in a divine way. And if you're just someone that is, you know, just a casual type of person, read about the numerical miracles and how there's certain words. Hey, anyways, just Google numerical miracles in the Quran and you'll see. That's all I'll say on that. And then the third thing I'll say is sometimes you have to experience darkness to appreciate the light. It took me going into the lowest of the low for me in terms of how I feel, in terms of life. I had to literally experience the darkness and see the darkness for me to then be able to see the light. And that's often how it happens sometimes. Because if everything was always light, you wouldn't be able to appreciate the light of Islam. You know? And another thing about the light is that's usually when things are noisy. That's usually when things are distracting. If you walk out the street during the day, there's so many things for you to see. But the darkness is usually associated with silence and solitude and quiet. That's why if you're in the dark and you see a lamp, you can see it. And you can hear the guidance coming because it's quiet and because there's no distractions. So if you're going through a dark time right now, that's often a blessing. That's often a good thing. That's why it says in, in Islam that trials are a blessing. Trials are the things that usually bring us the closest to Allah. And if Allah loves you, if God loves you, God is going to test you. He's going to put you through trials. Because think about it. If you get closer to Allah, your love for Allah increases. And as your love for Allah increases, you feel his love for you. So if Allah already loves us by default, he's going to want us to get closer to him. So embrace your trials as an invitation to grow closer to Allah. And use it as an opportunity to explore your spirituality, to explore your religion. That's all I'll say. But alhamdulillah, that's my full story. I don't know if I'll even end up posting this, to be honest, but I love it. My life has changed significantly ever since I reverted to Islam. Significantly. Like, significantly. I don't even recognize, I don't even remember who I was before. And... All the things I'm doing right now, I could not imagine myself doing it a couple years ago. Like the Cornell five years ago, if I were to see me myself right now, I would have not, I would have been like, that's not me. I don't think the same. I don't move the same. I don't speak the same. I haven't felt anxiety and I haven't over, I don't overthink anymore. I don't even remember what depression is. Like... I'm not anxious. I don't remember what 
over stressing about things is it's it's just a consistent piece that I have even when I'm going through difficult situations it's a, a certain level of peace and tranquility that comes with Islam because you remember that everything is good for you even the things that are uncomfortable even the things that make you feel sad or upset they're all a blessing because it's from Allah and Allah is not going to give you something just for the sake of giving you something negative it's because he knows there's something beautiful on the outside. Because he knows that there's wisdom in that situation. There's love in that situation. So I embrace it all. And at the end of the day, this entire life is going to feel like a couple of days. So whatever stressful situation you're feeling or going through, if your whole life is a day, how long is that one situation? It's going to feel like a minute. Maybe an hour when you really think about it. So don't let anything stress you. And if you're the type of person who's curious about Islam, again, just read the Quran. Research the Quran. And you'll see. It'll open up so many things in your mind and in your heart. So many things. And if you're already Muslim and you want to increase your Iman, take that next step. Take that next step. Because we all know deep down what we're being called to do. We all know deep down what that next thing is. Because again, this life is like a train. And Islam is meant to be a slow and beautiful journey. And everyone's at different stops. But everyone knows what that next stop is. So take whatever you need. Take that next step. And you'll see that Allah is going to show his love and his He's going to bless you with patience and tranquility and gratitude and peace. He's going to bless you with everything that you need to make life so much more beautiful, so much easier. But it takes us taking that step first. Inshallah, we get to that point. God willing, we get to that point. Assalamu alaikum.